Okay, welcome back. I'm Robert Breaker, and today I thought I'd come outside and do the Sermon of the Week. Uh, be honest with you, I thought about taking off this week. I've got so much going on and so much to do. Sometimes you just feel like you're drowning in so many things that need to be done. But uh, I do the best I can, and uh, rather than take off this week, the Lord kind of laid a little message on my heart, and I thought I'd share it with you out here in the, in the bright sun. It's uh, April 2021 here in Florida, and I'm just surprised how hot the sun is already this time of year. But it's cool outside, and we got a cold front moving in, so tomorrow it's supposed to be down in the 50s, so that'll be kind of a blessing. Uh, I love to read the Almanac every year, and the Almanac said it's going to be a cool uh, summer and a cool spring, so that's kind of a blessing for us here in Florida where it's usually hot, 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 hot. So I'm looking forward to that, but um, rather than just not put up a sermon this week, I thought it'd come out. I don't know if this will be a long one or a short one, but the Lord just kind of laid on my heart to talk to you and just read a couple verses and ask you two questions. Two questions that I want to um, ask today because I'm concerned about you and I'm greatly concerned with what I'm seeing happening in the world. And so I want to know if you've thought about what could happen. And if so, have you done anything to be ready and prepare yourself for what could happen? Now, uh, many of you, you've, you've shared in my life. I've done my best to, uh, to share a lot of who I am and where I'm from. Matter of fact, I'm here now on my property where I grew up as a kid. I've been playing here since I was two, three years old. A lot of times swimming out here in the bay and everything. And so a lot of you know who I am and where I come from. And I don't mind that. I think that's great that we can come together and you know who I am and, and learn from the Bible as I teach you. And uh, I just want to say I appreciate everybody that's praying for me and supporting me. And uh, what a blessing it's been in this journey as a missionary, as an evangelist, as a preacher, as a man, as a father, and things like that. But always in the back of my mind, I'm always thinking now, I better be careful or this could happen. Or I better watch out or this might take place. Or this at any day could come to pass. What, what do I do? And I always try to be prepared. As a child, I was in the Cub Scouts. Um, I don't remember. I think I was in the Boy Scouts for like a week and then we had to move. But I was in the Cub Scouts. I remember that. And in the Cub Scouts, you're always taught how to know something and how to use that to be able to survive. So always be prepared. And I'll never forget that. You get a patch for this and a patch for that and a patch for this. And so I preached a couple weeks ago on knowing and how important it is to know something. And that is important. But also putting into practice what you know is so important. So today let's go to two verses in the Bible. And I want to read these two verses, and I did not bring my watch this time, <laughs> but I don't expect I'll go as long as last time. I just have a couple little things I want to get off my chest here today and get out there to you that I hope will be a blessing, and I hope to stimulate you to thought, to thinking about your future, both spiritually and physically. I want you to think about that today. So turn with me, if you will, to two places in our Bibles. Let's go to Esther chapter 3 and verse 14 and Ezekiel 38, 7. Esther 3, 14 and Ezekiel 38, 7. And I'm going to ask you the question today. Actually, two questions that I have for you. And I want you to think about this. So Esther 3, 14, the Bible says this in Esther chapter 3 and verse 14. And in Esther 3, 14, we read, the copy of the writing for the commandment to be given in every province was published unto all people that they should be ready against the day. Now, I don't have time to get into uh, what this is talking about, but there was a time in which the government had set forth that something was to happen, and it was something bad. And uh, it was for the evil people to do something evil against Israel. But then God turned it to good and turned the heart of the king, and he wrote a writing in which the people of Israel could turn the bad thing into a good thing. But the commandment of the king was, be ready. Be ready. Let me ask you a question. Are you ready? Are you ready for what's coming? We'll get to that here in a minute. I really believe that Pandora's box is about to be opened on this world. And as a Christian, 
I know what's going to take place. I hold in my hand a book, a book of prophecy that tells me exactly what is going to happen. The only question is how much of it's going to happen before the rapture because we know that a lot of it takes place after the rapture. The book of Revelation tells us of the things that will take place during the tribulation period. So are you ready is the question. Now let's turn over to Ezekiel 38 and verse 7. Ezekiel 38, 7, Be thou prepared, and prepare for thyself, thou and all thy company that are assembled unto thee, and be thou a guard unto them. I find it interesting. The Bible talks about being ready, and the Bible talks about being prepared. So that's the title of my message today, Are You Ready? Are You Prepared? A simple question, are you ready, and are you prepared? You say, well, for what? You know, the Bible says, Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. We have no idea what might happen tomorrow. Anything can take place. So the question is, are you ready? Are you prepared? Well, I've found that a lot of people are completely, completely unprepared and completely not ready. And so I just want to throw out there some things today and just ask you to think about this because well, bad times are coming. I hate to be the bearer of bad news, but bad times are coming. <laughs> According to the authority of the Word of God, the Bible tells us that in the last days, there'll be perilous times. Let's turn over there real quick, 2 Timothy chapter 3. So I wish I could come to you and give you the good news that everything is fine, and everything is great, and everything's just going to go so well with you in your life. But you see, I'm not Joel Osteen. I can't say that. <laughs> I'm a realist, and I know my Bible. And the Bible teaches that there will be persecution of Christians. The Bible teaches that there will be problems and plagues and, and uh, natural disasters. And, and so the Bible tells us that it's not going to be all peaches and cream before he comes back. The only question is, how bad will it be for the Christians? Because it's going to be really bad for the lost world. So let's look at uh, 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's quickly read verse 1 through 9. Because this is a prophecy of the last days. And I firmly believe that we're in the last days. Look what it says. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinence, fierce, despisers of those that are good. You seen any of that today? My, everywhere you look. Traitors. Hmm, interesting. Heady, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof. From such turn away. The duty of a Christian is to turn away from wickedness and evil and ungodliness, not run to it. We're not to be a worldly people if we're saved. We're supposed to do everything we can to get away from the world. Well, to do that, you have to prepare. Can you live on your own and make it? Or are you fully dependent upon a wicked system? That's the question. And it continues there. For of this sort are they which creep into houses, verse 6, and lead captive silly women laden with lust, led away with diverse lusts. What does the world want? They want to creep in and get you over to their side and get you away from God. That's kind of scary. Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Why? Because the world hates God in the Bible. But the Bible says that when Jesus showed up, God manifested the flesh. He said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And the Bible is truth. Sanctify them through thy word. Thy word is truth. John 17, 17. Now, as Janus and Jambres withstood Moses, so did these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. There's a lot of those out there today. But they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs also was. So there are people out there that are against God and the Bible. They're wicked, evil men, and they're doing some bad, bad things that are going to hurt other people. I don't like that. As a Christian, I don't want to hurt anybody. I don't desire anyone to suffer or go through pain or, or anguish. Or I, I want people to, to have love and be happy, and I wish good upon all. Okay? But I'm also, like I say, a realist, and I know that something can happen at any moment. War could take place in any day. Did you hear about Ukraine and, and Russia and how shots have been fired and 
how there just happens to be uh, what possibly could be the start of World War III taking place. Heard about Israel and how they're uh, attacking, um, what is it, Iran, because Iran is wanting to make nuclear weapons. Any day we could hear on the news, war has been declared, and boom, there we start, another world war. I wasn't around in the last world war, that's over 70 years ago, but my grandmother was, and she told me about it and the things that people had to suffer and go through and the rationing and the things like that. Are you prepared for something like that if it started tomorrow, if it started today? Natural disasters, I'm sitting right here and when Hurricane Sally came, the water was about right here where I'm sitting down right now would be up to my neck. I thought Sally was gonna just go away like it usually does. Many of the hurricanes, they always go to the east or the west of us and they kind of miss us so I wasn't worried about it. But that was the second worst hurricane in my lifetime. The first was Ivan, and it filled three foot of mud in the bottom of our house. Now this was the second worst, and it came right here, the water level. But I was prepared. I knew, well, if something happens, at least I have a week's worth of food or two weeks or something like that. At least we can cook over open fire. I've got propane tanks, you know, and things like that. And I was prepared for something like that. Are you prepared for, I don't know, a, a global economic collapse? What would you do if tomorrow money was worthless? If the economy collapsed and there's no buying, there's no selling, there's, do you have food stored? Do you have things that you need to prepare yourself from a global economic collapse? They say if that happens within five days, there'll be no more food. All the shelves will be empty. What will you eat? If you're not careful, within a month, within two months, there'll be people running around starving that they'll literally be eating each other. And we've seen things like that happen down in South America where communists took over and collapses took place. And, and the first thing people did when they ran out of food was they began to eat their pets, their dogs, their cats, things like that. And then there were stories of them literally eating each other. And that's kind of sad. That's kind of sad. Are you prepared? I mean, uh, they're saying that the best thing to do is be prepared with at least six months food in your house. Do you have six months food in your house? A year would be better. I've been looking at all that and it's not that expensive. You know, for a couple thousand dollars, you could literally have about a year's worth of food stored up in your house, food that'll last 20, 30 years. I don't want to endorse the product, but I found that the best product is Ready Hour. And uh, my kids really like the Ready Hour macaroni and cheese. And sometimes we just buy that just to eat rather than go to the store. <laughs> but um, are you prepared? Are you prepared? That's a good question. What if something happened and your whole world changed? A lot of people are already seeing that with this COVID thing and how their whole world changed overnight. And now they're talking about, well, we'll never get back to normal. We'll never get back to normal. And a lot of people say, well, we made it through. But what if that was a cakewalk compared to what's about to take place? I just want to know, are you prepared? Go with me to Proverbs chapter 22. Are you ready for something like that? If something bad takes place, are you going to be a victim? Or are you going to be somebody that can take care of themselves? All right, now, hopefully the rapture takes place first. Well, even then, when the rapture takes place, have you ever thought what that entails actually? <laughs> All the graves of those that died as Christians break forth. And I told you several weeks ago on our resurrection message about how I think it will literally explode. The graves will blow up. Could you imagine on a massive scale all over the globe, all these people that were saved, their bodies coming out of an explosion. You know how terrified people will be? They'll be like, what happened? Was it a war? I mean, there are going to be some changes very shortly in this world. And if you're not saved, are you prepared for that? If you are saved, well, how prepared are you? You might have family, you might have friends that aren't Christians and you, you know they're not going at the rapture. Have you set aside something for them, perhaps? I mean, there's so many things to think about if you just sit down and just think for a little bit and say, well, now, you know, what if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? And that's what we should do. You say, well, oh, Breaker, you're an alarmist. Oh, you're, oh, you're, no. I'm following the Bible. Look at Proverbs 22, 3 with me, because the Bible tells us that we should think about these things and prepare. Proverbs 22 and verse 3. The prudent man 
for seeth the evil and hideth himself. But the simple pass on and are punished. The prudent man foreseeth the evil. So a man who's reading his Bible and studying the Word of God and he knows the times, the Bible tells us we should know and discern the times and know, you know, the days we're living in, and we should say, wow, wow, history repeats itself, okay? We're seeing a repeat in America of what has already happened in other countries. In other countries, the first thing they do is they destroy the system of government that's a republic and they set up a democracy. Right? And, and a matter of fact, this is an age-old plan, okay? Read Plato's Republic, okay? I don't really like philosophers, you know, the Bible warns us about philosophy, but Plato, I mean, he, he nailed it. He says there's always been a history of governments and they start as a republic, they fall into a democracy, they end up as a timiarchy or an oligarchy, and then it always turns into a tyranny. A tyrant takes over, a dictator. And the people get so fed up with the dictator, they overthrow him and then set up a republic. And then it starts to cycle over and over again. That has happened all throughout history. Have you ever studied history? Rome fell because it went from a republic to a democracy to an oligarchy to a tyranny. And they killed the tyrant, um, the first emperor, if you will, Julius Caesar. At Tu Brute, I mean, do you study history? Have you ever, ever looked into this? The way it works today is they take a republic and they say, no, no, we're a democracy. Then they say, no, 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 now we're a socialist country. And Lenin said the goal of socialism is communism. Whenever a country becomes socialist, they always end up as communist. That's just a cycle that has always happened. Well, wasn't it under Obama where Newsweek or one of those big magazines put out a, a title page that says, we're all socialists now. Oh, great. That's not good, is it? Um, you know what Nazism is? Nazism was the National Socialist Party. And when they got into power, they eventually turned everything into their favor and they became a fascist party. Fascism, where basically corporations rule everything. Gee, that kind of sounds familiar, doesn't it? What happens in a communist regime? Well, eventually, gulags, stalags, you know, Stalag 17, uh, concentration camps. So we're heading down the road of utter and complete tyranny in which a dictator takes over. Now, I'm not prophesying. I'm just showing you history repeats itself. That's what's happened before. And it doesn't take a genius to look at that and to look at our country and go, well, it looks like it's starting to pass the same thing. Have you prepared for that? Are you prepared for what might come? Now, the only hope we have, folks, is the rapture. So that's why I want you to be prepared. And my first point is I want you to be prepared spiritually. Okay? Are you prepared to go at the rapture? You say, well, yeah, yeah, I'm saved. Well, that's the way to be prepared for the rapture is to be saved so that when the rapture comes, you go. First and foremost, are you saved, okay? Are you ready to go with the rapture? I get phone calls, emails, and, and uh, uh, regular mail sometimes. People saying, Brother Breaker, I'm just so tired. I'm so ready for the rapture to come. And I say, are you ready? Have you prepared? Oh, yeah, yeah. What do you mean, have I prepared? I'm saved. It's good to be saved. But have you thought about after the rapture, when you get to heaven, will you have any rewards? Will you have anything up there? When the rapture comes, those that go to the rapture are those who are saved. If you missed the rapture, it was because you weren't saved. I've heard some people lately say, well, I'll just wait and go with the second rapture. That doesn't work that way. The Bible talks about the rapture of the church and the bride of Christ, the church, goes up. And then's the tribulation period. So if you miss the rapture, there's no second rapture you can just hang around and wait for. It doesn't work that way. You missed it. Now you have to endure to the end, Jesus said. And the only way to get your soul to heaven during that time is to choose Jesus Christ and allow the Antichrist to cut your head off because you refuse the mark of the beast. And the Bible says in the book of Revelation, and I saw the souls of them in heaven that were beheaded. So the souls of them that were slain for Jesus, okay? So that's the way to go to heaven is you have to give your life to Christ. Literally, let them cut your head off. That's way different. Today we trust in Jesus who gave his life for us. And we're saved and we go at the rapture. What a wonderful time, the age of grace. But after that, it's a different dispensation. And you're not just saved by believing in Jesus. You have to endure to the end of the seven-year period, which, good luck with that, 
because if you don't take the mark of the beast in your right hand or your forehead, then you can't buy or sell. How do you live if you can't buy or sell? How do you eat? How do you buy food? Um, I've never met a person in my life that said, you know what, I just finished fasting for seven years and I'm okay. No, if you don't eat for a couple of weeks, you're going to die. So these are things you need to think about. Are you saved? If not, you need to get saved. The Bible tells us how to get saved. The Gospels, 1 Corinthians 15, 1 through 4. How that Christ died for our sins and was buried and rose again the third day according to the Scriptures. And how Jesus shed His blood for our sins and how we are to trust in the blood. The Bible says through faith in His blood. Accept the payment that He made for our sins by faith. And then we're trusting in our Savior who loved us enough to die for us. And He takes us at the rapture. So are you saved? If not, then you've got to prove to God that you love Him enough that you die for Him. Completely reverse, completely different. So are you prepared for heaven by the sense of are you saved? But also, let me ask you this, have you laid up treasures in heaven? When you become saved, when you get saved through faith, the Bible says it's by faith, not of works, then you begin your life as a Christian in which you're supposed to be laying up treasures in heaven. You get treasures for praying. You get treasures for witnessing. You get treasures for passing out tracts. You get rewards in heaven for leading souls to Jesus Christ. Let me ask you a question. Have you ever led anyone to Jesus? I get so thrilled when I get emails from people saying, Brother Breaker, I got saved watching you on YouTube and seeing your message of the gospel, and I'm, I know now that I'm saved and I'm on my way to heaven. And I say, oh, praise God, man, that's wonderful. But one of the greater thrills is when people say, Brother Breaker, I won my first soul to Jesus Christ. I went out and witnessed to my neighbor or my brother or my sister or my mother, and they got saved. And I just go, whoo, glory. What a great thing. When the rapture comes, you'll go up and you'll look around and you'll see that person. You'll say, hey, and they'll probably run over to you and say, thank you so much for sharing the gospel. I'm here because you shared the gospel with me. How about you? Do you have anybody in heaven? Will there be any stones in your crown? It looks like in the Bible that there's five crowns that you can win as a Christian. And one of them is a soul winning crown. If you won someone to the Lord, that you get a crown for winning someone to the Lord. And every person you win to the Lord, it's almost like they're a stone in your crown. You say, yeah, I, I want that, Brother Breaker. Okay, go look at my video on YouTube on how to win souls. And get out there and witness and pass out tracts and tell people how to be saved. That's important. It's important. Are you prepared? Well, you say, yeah, I'm saved. Well, being saved is great. But uh, have you laid up anything in heaven? Do you have anything to show for your salvation when you get to heaven? Or will you just get there and go, oh, good, well, I'm here. Well, the Bible teaches when we get to heaven, there's what's called the judgment seat of Christ. And the judgment seat of Christ, you're judged not for your sins. Those are at Calvary. You're judged for your service. And God will look at you and say, now how much did you love me and what did you do for me after you got saved? And boy, what a time that will be. Um, will you have anything? So when I say, are you prepared? Yes, I'm asking, are you saved? But have you done anything for Jesus after you got saved? Have you witnessed? Have you told other people? I believe, folks, that the rapture is very, very, very soon. So that's why, to me, we need to be the ones out there witnessing and telling people, hey, get saved because Jesus is coming. And if they don't get saved when it does come, the first thought in their mind was, oh, yeah, that guy said this was going to happen. And they'll know that you told the truth. That's called being a witness. So are you ready? Are you ready? Okay, I had just three points here. I don't want to go too long, but number one, do you have any discernment? A lot of people say, oh, this message doesn't apply to me. It doesn't matter if I'm ready. It doesn't matter if I'm prepared. My hope's the rapture, and it is. And so I'll just go at the rapture. That's the end of it. Who cares? Well, the question is, what will happen before the rapture? The rapture could be in a month. The rapture could be in five or six months. The rapture could be in a year or two. I don't see how it could be much longer than about five or six years. But uh, what could happen before the rapture? Have you prepared for that? Do you have any discernment? I have noticed lately, and I'm very, oh, I don't even know if I should talk about this, but I'm very, very, very disappointed in modern Christians. I really am. I'm very disappointed in some of my brothers and sisters in Christ because they don't appear to have much discernment. My father always used to say, son, practice discernment. 
Discernment is one of the most important things that we have. Discernment is putting on your Bible goggles is the only way I know to describe it. Discernment is saying, okay, the Bible says this. Now I'm looking at what's happening in the world and guess what? It's all falling in line with the Bible. So when I see the world, I look at that and I say, now I know what they're going to do next. I know what their agenda is. I know what their plan is. The Bible says the agenda is to bring in a one world government, new world order, if you want to use that term, in which the Antichrist rules on this earth for seven years. And since the 90s, I've been watching all this, and I've been seeing this, and I've been seeing how they're giving more power to the UN, how they're signing away our rights, how they're setting up a one world system and a one world government, how behind the scenes they're doing everything they can to try to set up this, you know, uh, uh, 5G network of things. And this, um, well, there's some things I can talk about, some things I can't. But look into that, you know, 060606 patent and look into the ultimate goal. See, what the devil wants is he wants your soul. If he can't have your soul, he wants your body. If he can't have your body, he wants your mind. So the devil is going all out trying to get everyone to be under him for this world system. And as Christians, we should practice discernment. We should see this and we should say, no, that's not a system that we're going to be here for because the rapture is coming first. And so we can't go along with this system. So we're supposed to get away from it. But I've noticed lately that a lot of Christians, it's almost like they're spiritually blind because they're not, they're not seeing what's happening. And they don't understand what they're doing is not for our betterment. <laughs> what they're doing is their agenda and their plan. Anyway, I don't want to talk too much about that in this sermon. What I thought I'd do next week, is just unload on you. Just give you everything I know. And we'll probably have to go to another platform for that. But I want you to know, I think I'll call it, do you see what I see? But anyway, this is just a simple message just to ask you, are you prepared? Go to Proverbs 7.7. 7. And Proverbs 7.7 7 says, And behold, among the simple ones, I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. That's probably one of the greatest sins today is the lack of discernment. And the Bible calls those that aren't out there trying to discern things simple ones. And the Bible says the simple pass on. Interesting. Pass on. We, we would say when somebody dies, well, they passed away or they passed on. And uh, it's interesting. You better be informed. You better know some things. You better study. You better practice discernment. Or it, it might just cost you your life. What a sad thing it would be to go before the rapture if you're a Christian. So look into some things and, and look into what's happening in the world and study it for yourself. Don't just take people at face value what they're saying. Discern what they're saying, okay? A wink, wink, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, if you don't, next week you will, okay? Next week I'm going to be on, probably on Rumble and uh, I'm going to explain to you what's happening in this world. And I want to know, can you see it? Do you see it? Well, how about this one, Ecclesiastes 8.5? I just had a couple verses I wanted to share today. I don't want to go too long because I've still got to edit this and everything. And we've got a lot happening. Uh, matter of fact, let me tell you this. Today, later on this afternoon, we're having delivered our first RV camper. I'm talking about being ready and being prepared. Well, my dad would always say this, work your plan and plan your work. And so he'd say, son, make a plan in your life of what your plan is, your goal. Plan your work and then work your plan. And I've always tried to do that. I've always had a goal in life, but I'm noticing in the last, I don't know, two, three years, every plan, every goal that I've had, it's unattainable. They keep changing the goalposts and, and messing things up. And now it's like, wow. <laughs> so for years we've been looking at, well, what is an RV that we could get? Kind of a bug out vehicle or whatever you want to call it. You know, say people say, get your bug out bag. If you don't know what a bug out bag is, look that up. Be prepared, prepare a bug out bag in case something happens and you need to bug out, you need to get away, you need to go someplace. But uh, we, we finally were able to save up enough and we've been looking for years for a little pull behind RV camper that we can have in case another hurricane comes or in case something bad happens and we can get out and we can go. Remember we were kicked out of a hotel one time because we wouldn't put a mask on. And so it's getting harder and harder to find these RV campers because people are buying them left and right. 
A lot of people of COVID have lost their homes and everything, and so they're living in RV trailers. It's interesting. We're about to have a transient society. Isn't that odd? Isn't that odd? So we've been looking for years, and since about 2007, 2008, many of them, they're just throwing them together. They don't care, and they're not taking any sort of, uh, you know, uh, I hate to say the word pride, but they're not, they're not making quality stuff. So we've been looking for years and we've seen the prices go up and up and we're just like, I, we can't afford this. I don't. And then finally we found one that's all aluminum and you can actually stand on the top. Many of your RV campers that you buy new, they say, don't stand on the top, you'll fall through. It's like, what, what did you make? A cardboard box or something? Well, we found one that's a, that's a really good one and you can stand on top and it has all the bells and whistles and solar panels and things like that. And we finally broke down and got one and I'm excited about it. And it's supposed to be delivered today talking about being prepared. And so that's one of the ways that we've decided over the years, this is one of our goals, is to eventually get one of those. And we have some friends that have them and we're gonna be able to go out camping more and finding places to go because you never know. Anything can happen and you need to get away. So we're prepared for that. And so I'm kind of excited that's supposed to be delivered today and we're looking forward to that. And then the next goal is to hopefully find a piece of property. I guess I was thinking too big. I wanted like 80 to 100 acres. Well, that's almost impossible to find nowadays. Um, so if we could just get 20, 30 acres and have some place where we can go in case things get bad, then we'd have a place to get away. In World War II, it was like that. World War II, many people in England, they lived in the cities, but they had a home in the country. And when Hitler was bombing the cities with his V2 rockets and everything, people would take the train and stay out in the country so they would be safe. They prepared. Are you prepared? Do I have time to go into that? I might as well since I started on it. Here in America, you know what I found? Um, we found an agent looking for property and he says, no, no, an acre of land in your, in your county should not be more than a, about a 1,500 an acre. You know what? It's 4,000, 5,000, 6,000 an acre right now. Everything is two to three times more what it should be because they have put out a fake um, uh, boom on things and they're trying to make people think supply and demand that, that property is in high demand but here's what's happening Bill Gates and rich people like that are buying up land all over America and I just heard that our, our state government is now buying up land and they have driven the price of land up by our taxpayer dollars and they're buying land to make it state land so that little guys like me can't afford it anymore it's just so frustrating to see how they're just they're ruining everything it's it almost is like there's some sort of conspiracy that this is on purpose to hurt the little guy no 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 that that no that no 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 nothing no that can't be right no 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 they they care about us don't they yeah yeah so no that no that can't be but um it's getting harder and harder to be prepared are you prepared do you have any food stored up storageable food just in case you know, a lot of people, they got a check for $600 from the government and then another check for $1,400. What'd you spend that on? You know, you could have spent that on a year's worth of food and been prepared. I wonder if you did that. Hmm. Anyway, what did I say? Go to, go to Ecclesiastes 8, chapter 5. Here I go rambling again. Ecclesiastes chapter 8 and verse 5. Are you prepared? Do you have discernment? The first thing you need to do is make up your mind. Yeah. Yeah, I think you're right. Bad times are coming. And then you can begin to prepare. But have you made up your mind? I've, I've met Christians that are wishy-washy and they haven't made up their mind yet. And they're like, I don't know. I think the raps are still off a couple years. I think there's still time. I, I'm not in any hurry. Um, can I just say, get in a hurry? Make haste. You know how many times the Bible says make haste? Maybe you should be prepared just in case okay remember the year 2000 2000 was coming and they're like it's the end of the world the computers are going to crash and and there was a division among christians half of christians said uh it's nothing and in the other half of christians they started storing food and water and all this stuff and those christians made fun of them and i was kind of in the middle i was like i don't want to attack anybody i'm just going to store up some stuff just to be safe but i said you know i'm going to test this they're telling me all the computers will stop. So I went to my computer down on the date and I put it in 2001. And then I changed the date 
and lo and behold, my computer worked. <laughs> and so I said, oh, okay, so this whole thing is a lie just to scare people. The computer will not stop working when it hits, you know, January 1st, 2000. This was all a big scam and a lie, huh? And so I said, oh, okay. So, you know, but that's called discernment. I discerned the whole Y2K thing as a scam, and that's what it was. But anyway, you need to practice discernment. Ecclesiastes 8.5, let me read that quickly. Whoso keepeth the commandment shall feel no evil thing, and a wise man's heart discerneth both time and judgment. Do you see the time we're in? Do you see what's taking place? Do you see what the Bible says will happen? Wars and rumors of wars, earthquakes in diverse places. Um, I don't know if you've been keeping up, but there have been more earthquakes in the last couple of years than almost my whole lifetime. Uh, volcanoes all around the world are erupting. Have you noticed that? Natural disasters, floods, hurricanes, tornadoes, everywhere, unlike any other time in history. Are you prepared for that? If not, you need to be. You got to make up your mind. You got to use discernment. You got to see this and see what's taking place. Next, you got to have a desire. Do you desire? Now, maybe I'm talking to somebody that's single and they're like, well, I'll be okay. I don't have anybody to, you know, take care of. But then again, I might be talking to someone who has a family. Well, if you have a family, then you should have the desire to want to take care of them. So if you're a father or if you're someone who has a family like a mother or if you're a grandfather or something like that and you have access to your family to, to help them and you can always invite them to your house to take care of them, you have a responsibility to be stocked up on food and things like that. And if a bad time does happen, you have something. But do you have that desire? Do you have that want to take care of them? Have you thought about it and have you prepared? Are you ready? Psalms 27.4. Again, I just want to give you a lot of verses that I hope will be a, a blessing to you. And I just want to stimulate you to think about what could happen. And then whether you're prepared for it. You know, the military teaches you, Semper Fi is it? Always Semper Fidelis or whatever the one is. Always ready. It's not wrong to be ready and prepare for something. It's better that something not happen and you be prepared than it happen and you not be prepared. Right? Psalms 27 4 says this, One thing have I desired of the Lord that will I seek after, that I may dwell in the house of the Lord all the days of my life to behold the beauty of the Lord and to inquire in His temple. What did David say? He said, There is something that I have desired in my life, and it's the Lord, and it's His temple. So David's desire was for God. How much of a desire do you have for God? Well, do you desire the rapture? I've talked to Christians lately that say, well, I don't have that desire for the rapture. You know, I want to get married first, or I want this to come first, or I want that to take place first. And there are a lot of people out there that claim to be Christians. They don't care that the rapture's coming. What? I talk to other people the exact opposite. Brother Breaker, there's nothing more that I want in this world than Jesus come back. I thought about it the other day, my wife and I were joking. What if a genie shows up and he gives you three wishes, you know? What would your wish be? My wife says, well, my wish would be infinite wishes. <laughs> and I said, well, my wish would be I'd only take one of the three. And I said, you know what my wish would be? That the Lord Jesus Christ come back right now. <laughs> that would be my wish. Because what, what's more important than that? It's my desire. My desire as a man, as a Christian, is to get to heaven with my Savior and be with Him. I love Him that much. But as a father, my desire is, until he comes, I want to provide for and take care of my family, and I want to prepare. So I'm trying to prepare, trying to get things in order so that I have something, in case something bad happens, we have something that we can be prepared, and we can make it and get through whatever bad may come before the rapture. Do you have that desire? Psalms 38, 9. How about a desire to take people, like I said before, to heaven with you? Do you have a desire to win souls? See, a lot of people in this world, they're not thinking about what's to come. They're only living in the here and now. That's dangerous. To not prepare for the future, that's dangerous. They say most people in America have nothing to show for their life and for their work. And they're just living week to week, paycheck to paycheck. And they have nothing laid up, nothing in store. So when the crash comes, 
or when the war comes or when a disaster comes, they'll have nothing. Then they'll have to rely on other people. But how do you know other people will, will take care of you? You don't. Most people are selfish and they don't want to take care of you. It really is a dog eat dog world. So it is good to have something to be prepared in case something bad does happen. That's all I'm saying in this message and I hope it's a blessing. Psalms 38 and verse 9. Psalms 38 9 says, Lord, all my desire, all my desire is before thee, and my groaning is not hid from thee. <laughs> I find that interesting. He says, Lord, I just desire you, and I'm just groaning. Oh, Jesus, help. Oh, Jesus, come. Oh, Jesus, deliver me. Oh, I talk to a lot of Christians, and they say it's the same thing. They look at the way the world's going, and it's the opposite of the way it used to be. And it's the opposite of the way that it's supposed to be for a Christian. And it's harder and harder and harder to get ahead in life. And they're, they're just like, oh, I'm groaning and groaning and going, oh, Jesus, come back. <laughs> Is that how you are? That, that shows somebody that, that really cares about the Lord, that really believes the book. And they know the rapture is coming. And they're like, come on, Lord, come on back. I won't read Romans 8.22, but it talks about how the whole world is groaning in travail. Even this world is like, oh, come back, Jesus. Give us the millennium where everything's perfect because man is destroying the earth. They really are, and that's kind of a sad thing. Well, do you have discernment? Have you seen that something bad could happen anytime? And have you made up your mind to prepare? Do you have that desire to be prepared? Now, this is a message in which I'm talking spiritually and physically, okay? Both places. And do you know your duty? Do you realize that you have a duty? Physically, you have a duty to your family to store up something for them in case bad times happen. Whether it be storageable food, whether it be something else, are you prepared for them to have provision if bad times come? But how about as a Christian? Have you as a Christian done your duty? When you get to heaven at the rapture, if you're saved, will you hear these words? Because this is all I live for is to hear these words someday from my Savior. Well done, now good and faithful servant. I want to know that I did the best I could to serve the Lord. And so I'm doing that. I'm doing all I can to preach, to teach, to try to tell people the truth and the gospel and win people to the Lord. We try to pass out tracts. We try to witness. And the Lord's blessing that. And I feel like I'm doing the best I can because, boy, there's a lot of other things I have to do in the physical world. But I want as much as I can to do what I can for the spiritual world and lay up treasures in heaven. And I feel like as a Christian, it's my duty to tell other people the truth. Do you have that same desire? Is that your duty? 2 Timothy 4, 2. 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 2 says, Preach the word. Be instant in season, out of season. Reprove, rebuke, and exhort with all long suffering and doctrine. For the time will come, I believe it already is here, for the time will come where they will not endure sound doctrine. But after their own lust shall they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. And they shall turn away their ears from the truth and be sh shall be turned into fables. But watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. Until Jesus does come back, it is our job as Christians to witness and tell others, hey, the Bible is the answer. The Bible is right. This book has been proven true time and again. But yet all you hear from the world is, oh, we don't believe that book. Men wrote that book. Oh, that Bible, yeah, that's just an old, old story, fairy tales. Old fairy tales, that's not a true, oh, don't listen to that book. And yet day after day after day, archaeologists are uncovering things in Israel and other places that prove the Bible is not only a book of true history, but it's also a prophetic book. If you have a Bible, you have written history, not only past, but future. And everything we're seeing coming to pass in this world is exactly the way the Bible says it. Revelation 13. Go to Revelation 13. And I saw no man could buy or sell save he that had the mark or the name of the, uh, of the beast or the number of his name and all this stuff. And you can't buy or sell without a mark. That sounds a lot like a quantum digital tattoo. You know, and, and how was it the Gates Foundation is saying, you know, we think you ought to have a vaccine passport. You know, part of that passport could be a digital tattoo on your head and you can't buy or sell without, and you're just looking at all this and you're just going, it's all according to the book. <laughs> but you need to share that with people. You need to tell people, look, this isn't just an accident what we're seeing happening in the world. This is all leading up to what the Bible teaches 
a global one world government in which the Antichrist rules and makes people take the mark of the beast. You can be a part of that, won't work out well for you according to the Bible, or you can come to Jesus Christ. And whatever we may suffer before the rapture, prepare, but also tell others and get people saved and lay up treasures and store in heaven because the more you do for the Lord, the more you get in heaven. There's a lot more verses that I wanted to get into, but let me just close with this. Are you prepared for the rapture? Are you saved? And have you laid up something in store? You see, a lot of people will take this message and say, oh, this breaker guy, he's telling Christians to, to stock up something in their house and get supplies. What a dumb thing. If they're going to the rapture, why do they need that? <laughs> Well, it's not just for you in case something happens. It's for those people that miss the rapture. If they come to your house and you're a saved Christian and you're raptured out and they find a year's worth of food, you've helped them live a year in which they don't have to take the mark of the beast. You're helping them. So I don't see it's wrong in any way for a Christian to lay up storage down here on earth and get supplies together. Now, I'm not what you call a doomsday prepper because I don't believe we go through the tribulation. But I do believe in being prepared. So there's nothing wrong with being prepared because when the rapture comes, you've left something behind for somebody that could use it. And them to say no to the Antichrist and be able to live because they won't be able to buy or sell based off of what you've left behind. Have you ever thought of that? Have you ever thought of that? Plan your work and work your plan. Uh, let's go to 1 Timothy 6, 17. Oh man, there's so much more I wanted to say in this message. Um, but uh, kind of scatterbrained, kind of all over the place. But it is what it is. I just want you to think about getting prepared. There's so many companies online now that sell their um, long-term storage food, 20 years. And you're getting handouts from the government. $600 stimulus, $1,400 stimulus. There's really no excuse to not take that money and put it into long-term storage food for you in case something bad happens before the rapture and for those that are left behind. To me, it's just like a no-brainer. Why don't you do that? Because it's the right thing to do. <laughs> Be prepared so you don't have to rely on someone else. Rely on the Lord and trust in Him, but also know, now I've got this here just in case something happens. And I have this to help someone else if need be. All right, that's what it all boils down to. 1 Timothy 6, 17. 1 Timothy 6, 17 says, Charge them that are rich in this world that they be not high-minded, nor trust in uncertain riches, but in the living God who giveth us richly all things to enjoy. That they do good, that they be rich in good works, ready to distribute, willing to communicate, laying up in store for themselves a good foundation against the time to come, that they may lay hold on eternal life. So here, now, willing to distribute. Get as much as you can stored up in case bad times are coming, and when they do, you've got something to help others. But also, as a Christian, take that as a lesson to the spiritual I'm saved, I'm going at the rapture. Have I laid up anything in heaven? Have I laid up in store rewards? Have I served Jesus Christ? Have I won souls to Jesus Christ? Have I witnessed, when I get to heaven, will I have any rewards? Let's make sure we're doing that. Now, I had here tourniquet, so I might as well tell that story. I'm kind of done. I gave my message, I gave all my verses. But um, one time we went to a knife show. I, I love knives. Uh, I'm just a knife guy. I just really like high-end, nice, well-made knives. I just think they're just a piece, a work of art, actually. They're beautiful, but also they're utilitarian in, in use. They're tools, but I just, I like to collect knives. And uh, so um, I have certain knives that are kind of cool. My favorite knife is a Randall knife because they're made down in Orlando, Florida, and they're just a lot of history, and they're just well-made, and they're beautiful, but they're expensive. You know, I don't, I don't have a lot of them because they're so expensive. I like to try to find stuff like that at garage sales and get them at a good price. But my daughter and I, we went to a knife show in Biloxi, Mississippi, which is oh, a couple hours away, and uh, we were at this knife show, and I look over, and there's this corner room there, and there's this sign-up sheet. And so I walk over and I said, hey, what is this all about? The sign-up thing. 
and they said, well, we're giving a class on how to apply tourniquets. And it's, I don't know if it was $10 a person or $20 a person, I can't remember. And uh, it's an hour long class and we go over basic um, kits and medical kits and things like that. And just literally hands on learning about tourniquets and how tourniquets can save your life. And I looked at my daughter and, I, and my daughter, she wants to be a veterinarian. Now, I don't know if that'll ever amount to anything. I wanted to be a fireman when I was a kid, um, didn't work out. But uh, she would like to be a veterinarian. So I said, this something you wanna do? So we looked at all the knives and everything, and then we came over and we, we said, when's it start? Oh, two o'clock, so it was a couple hours away, and so we waited, and I paid the money, and we went in, and we took the hour-long course, and it was a course given by a guy who was a medic in the military who, from what I understand, he actually has a TV show on one of these cable stations, and I forget the name of the show or something, but uh, he's a pretty big-name person that, that uh, is on some show. Well, anyway, uh, we took this class, and uh, they taught us about rubber tourniquets, uh, other kind of tourniquets, tie-down tourniquets. We learned so much about tourniquets. And it opened my mind into thinking about something that I had never thought of before. Tourniquets can save your life. Now here I am as a Christian, as a man of God, an ordained minister of the gospel, and I'm interested in saving people's souls. That's the spiritual job that God has given me. And it slipped my mind, I guess, that you can also save people's lives if the time comes and be prepared for that. And so they showed us how to use these tourniquets. And I found to me that my favorite type of tourniquet was the one that twists. And it has this long bar on it and you twist it. And you put it all the way up and you twist it. And then it actually has little buckles that go over when you twist it and you lock it in place. And by the way, if you do get that tourniquet, don't get the plastic one. The plastic can break. Get the aluminum rod. And, and usually they cost more, but you know for sure that you know nothing's going to happen. It's not going to break. This thing's going to work. After we finished that class, I went out of there and I went home. I spent several hundred dollars. I think it was Chinook Medical Supply or something like that. And uh, I bought tourniquets. I put one in each car. I put one in, in each of our uh, medical bags. I bought a lot of medical stuff. And it, it got me to thinking, look, I want to be prepared because I don't know what might happen tomorrow. Here where we live, that bridge over there to Pensacola was knocked out. And we are still dealing with the effects of that bridge being knocked out over in Pensacola. It's closed and they won't open that bridge, they say, until Memorial Day, which is uh, almost June. So all the traffic to that bridge has been diverted behind our house uh, about half a mile that way. And all that traffic is going that way in order to go around. And they're using this bridge now. We used to have a joke here in the neighborhood because we never had traffic here. That when we come to the stop sign, if we saw a car coming, just one car, we'd say, oh, traffic jam. <laughs> Well, now we stop at that stop sign and there's so much traffic, it sometimes takes us five minutes just to get across the traffic to get into the lane in order to go to town. And so we're still suffering from those effects. And just in the last couple of months, people are getting so frustrated because sometimes it's it's back to back traffic and it's stopped because there's a light on that end and a light over here at the interstate. And so traffic is backed up so much that people are just stopped. And in the morning and in the evening, you know, people traveling to work, the traffic is so bad that people are starting to get road rage, starting to get upset, getting angry. And so they'll start to pass on the right or they'll try to pass someone. And there have literally been deaths right up here at this bridge, not a mile from our house. At least four or five people died who passed and hit another car head on and died. And so seeing things like that and seeing the increased traffic and seeing, I want to be prepared in case something happens. And so I bought those tourniquets. And my thought is, if ever I'm in a wreck or if I see a wreck and I jump out and someone's arm is cut off or their leg is, 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 is cut off or something, I know how to try to help save them in applying a tourniquet. Now, I hope to God that never happens, but if it does, I want to be prepared. I don't want to pull up on a scene like that and see it and go, ooh, lots of blood, I wish I could help you, and then watch them literally die in my arms. I, I don't want to see that. I want to know that I have at least an, enough basic medical knowledge that I could say, oh, that needs a tourniquet. Okay, let me grab that and then it, 
okay, the, the police are on their way. Here comes the ambulance. Look, we're stopping the bleeding the best we can. Now hang with me, and then hopefully I can give them the gospel <laughs> and, and take care of their spiritual needs. Amen? Because that's what an ordained minister is. He's someone that takes care of the spiritual needs of his people. First, get saved. Second, now that you are saved, try to help others get saved. But also, there's nothing wrong with telling people, now look, there are some physical needs that you have. Let's look at what the Bible says about that. And according to the Bible, I've showed you the verses today, it looks like the prudent man foreseeth the evil and prepareth. Are you prepared? In the old days in America, they used to store up canned goods. And I still remember as a kid uh, doing cans every year and taking those mason jars and, and uh, the ball jars, B-A-L-L, -L, and putting your food in them and putting them into the, the thing to where they're um, boiled and then hearing the noise, you know, and how wonderful that was. And that was to lay up things in case something happened during the year you had a storage of food. And that's the way our ancestors did it. And we've gotten away from that. Maybe we need to get back to doing that. Maybe we need to start storing up food just in case. Because the Bible says in the last days, perilous times will come. I believe we're in those days. And I want to help you spiritually. I want to make sure you're saved. And if you are saved, I want you to live for the Lord and win people to the Lord. But I would be amiss if I didn't say, hey, and also make sure that physically you are laying up stuff that you're prepared for whatever may come. That you might have for you and your family Maybe even some extra to share with someone else. And even something to leave behind after the rapture for those that go through the tribulation. So there it is. I hope that's been a blessing to you. I just wanted to get that off my heart. And I just wanted to ask you two questions. Are you ready? Are you ready for the rapture? I am. I'm looking up and I can't wait. But until it comes, I'm trying to make sure that I'm prepared for whatever may happen before the rapture. Are you prepared? If not, get prepared. Get prepared spiritually and get prepared physically. And just make sure that everything is, is prepared. Boast not thyself of tomorrow, for thou knowest not what a day may bring forth. One of my favorite verses. We don't know what tomorrow may hold. We have no idea. But make sure. Another thing I should have said was, do you have a box of Bibles? Everybody should have a box of Bibles. And go out and, and hand those out to people. Make sure you give those away. And uh, leave some in your house. You know, if you're raptured out, people come into your house, they should find a Bible. And they'll probably want to read it. They'll probably go, oh, that guy kept saying this would happen. And he was a Bible believer. Let me, I'll start reading the Bible. <laughs> That's a good thing. Maybe, maybe get a, a letter to your family that says, look, if I'm not here, it's because I was raptured. And here's what the Bible says now, since you missed it, you know, and things like that. There's so many different ways that you can be prepared and try to show people the truth. I want you to start thinking about that, and then I want you to do that. I want you to be ready, and I want you to be prepared. All right, thank you for watching. See you next time. God bless. Bye-bye. Okay, so... Um, talking about preparation and preparing, and so I thought maybe I'd just, well, show you a little something that we've done lately. We're trying to prepare for whatever may come, and we're trying to enjoy life until the rapture comes. So we got some chickens, and have you seen some of the little baby chicks? Well, some of those lived, some of those didn't. So we went and got some more, and this is our little, we open it here. This is our little movable chicken thing. And here's the chickens. Hey, buddies. Hey, buddy. Oh, come on. Come on now. Let me hold you one. Oh, this one's a sweetie. This one we hatch ourselves. And it's so pretty, isn't it? It's actually a bantam. It's smaller than the others. Chickens are so beautiful. And so if you could do something like this, you know, it's not a bad thing to, to get out there and have some chickens and stuff. Trying to prepare. Who knows what will happen? Maybe they'll be left behind, and the people after will need them. I don't know. But aren't these chickens beautiful? Uh, go, go, buddy, go. I like chickens. They're so pretty. So, yeah, there's a lot of things you can do to prepare for what's going to happen. And hopefully... Come here, buddy. Come here. I want people to see you. Come here. Yeah, I got gotcha. you. Yeah. I think this one's called CL. We named them. 
this is one of those that we hatched and it's growing pretty big look at this beautiful chick or not a chick anymore it's starting to be bigger it's still got some growing room but uh chickens are fun so there's many ways to get prepared going in and uh, a lot of things you can do so think about it the rapture's coming but what did jesus say occupy till i come that's where we get our word occupation so work you're not saved by works but after we're saved we should work and until he comes well this is fun we can enjoy life we can do things and we can prepare for the unforeseen bad that could happen and there's nothing wrong with having chickens you know we hopefully we'll get to some eggs okay well thank you so much we'll see you next time bye bye